As mentioned in my last video, this one is entirely dedicated to the meridian and the building process. If you want to know more about the individual parts and why I picked or what I had to pick in some cases, check out my last video where I talk more in depth about that. Today's episode is also split into two parts, the first one being a brief overview of the Meridian, while the second one is all about the build and the ensuing struggles within. You can skip ahead using the bookmarks below if you like, or stay right here. So without further ado, let's have a look at the Meridian. Finishing a supremely nice aluminum and coming in with a 60% form factor, the Meridian is a densely compressed custom from Prime Keyboards. Cold to the touch and heavy to the lift, it oozes a certain heft when being picked up. Weighing about 1.5 kilos fully loaded, it's a chunky boy too. Once placed, it sits flush and firm to the ground, secured by the four included rubber feet while resting at a comfortable 7 degree angle, which is about the same as a Keychron K6 with the first level of feet being popped out. There are no built-in adjustments otherwise, but there is a wrist rest you can get with the board. I didn't, and I find the typing to be exceedingly comfortable even without it. This is not only due to the split nature, but also due to the fact that the front chin is a little shallower than most boards, or the K6 I've been using. The split is at a reduced 8 degree angle as opposed to the more commonly found 12, making the transition from a standard layout to this a little less jarring, which I can confirm, although I have absolutely no experience with other split keyboards, what I can say is that this took me a little less than a day to get used to. On the upper right you'll find the three slightly recessed LED indicators, which belong to the caps, num and scroll lock and are indicated by their RGB color designation. By that I mean their respective colors are red, green and blue, although not in that order. The board itself does not have RGB, but as I neither have the right caps nor the preference for it, I didn't mind this. The USB-C cable is slightly off-center to the left, but sits otherwise seamless to the back end of the board. There is a slight indentation to the sides, showing the two-piece construction coming together, which is something often found on IO3 designed boards, at least that seems to be the case. Finally, there is a given name embossed to the bottom, with a nice rounded off font. Looking inside, you'll find a brass weight coming in at exactly 250 grams. Hidden for the unsuspecting are engraved sigils of its collaborators, Prime Keyboard and the aforementioned IO3 Studios, a design team that has some impressively good looking boards under their belt. Other than that, you'll have the aluminum plate along with the PCB. This is a top mounted board, meaning that the plate and the accompanying PCB are screwed to the top of the housing. There are many different styles out there and if you want to know more about that and the differences, I recommend looking up this handy pamphlet I found on Reddit. The color you're looking at is called dark grey and under certain conditions there's a slight bluish tint, but more than anything else, it's a dark and cold grey. Everything also felt very exact, the screws were all nicely threaded and securing the different elements felt as satisfying as picking it up, although for some reason none of the screws were magnetic or lost most of their strength, which made this assembly a little more tedious than it had to be. But the important thing is that everything else matched up with no gaps or wiggling. There is no rattling of any kind or anything else that would otherwise taint the experience, making for a supremely good looking and feeling build. Putting the Meridian together by itself isn't really that difficult. Not counting the PCB, the entire construction only consists of three parts. The top, the plate and the bottom. For this assembly you only need to loosen two levels of screws. That of the outer case, which is secured by these eight and the second level for the plate and PCB, which is held in by another 9. Then it's off to test the PCB, checking if everything works as it should before continuing to loop the stabs. In this case, Durox screw in V2s, which I looped with Crytox to a 5G0, like everybody else on this planet. At this point I thought, this is fantastic, can't wait to type on this and start editing this video tonight. <laughs> I've heard that looping switches can be a bit of a time-consuming endeavor and was very excited to use that excuse to catch up on some long overdue shows I've been meaning to binge, but while watching Thea's great how-to video on this topic, I had to flinch when he said it would take him around an hour to loop 10 to 15 switches. I can loop around 10 to 15 switches an hour. So if I, I thought to myself, I'll take those 10 and I'll raise them to a nice and even 20. I mean, how hard can it be? <laughs> <coughs> So, after going through the first two acts of Arcane, which is brilliant by the way, go see it if you haven't, I started to count my accomplishments and had to realize that, how do I elegantly phrase this, I really suck at this. So I continued to loop through the entire first season of What If, but still, I wasn't finished. Looking for my next fix, I was disappointed to find out that Netflix's Cowboy Bebop hadn't been released yet. Although now that it has been and I've seen it, I have to say, I'm very sorry Netflix, but it's not working out for me. 
mushy mushy. Maybe some people like it, but I just can't do it. I don't know who this is, but this is definitely not vicious. <coughs> this, this is vicious. Vicious. Wrapping up, I did eventually finish, but not without realizing that some switches developed a nasty sound caused by overlooping. Which resulted in me having to loop the spare ones I had hoped to keep for emergency situations, which it kinda ended up being. I also want to mention that I decided to add switch films. This is a small piece that goes in between the housing to create a more firm fit for the housing and for the plate, which should result in a more consistent sound by reducing the potential wobble or play. However, this created this second problem during the building process. I keep saying in these videos that you should do your research, but I clearly didn't do enough. Although in my defense, these weren't the switches I originally planned to use. Anyway, like with all things, I tested the films out on my Keychron first, but couldn't hear any audible difference between those who had them and those who didn't, but decided that since I bought them, I might as well use them. See if I like it. Well, they made the switches firmer, right? At times pushing them in felt almost impossible, and I got close to killing my right thumb trying to get them in. I tried to space them out, hoping that if I would distribute the weight, it would help me keep the plate and the PCB aligned. Still, there were certain ones who took an unreasonable amount of force to get in. At some point, I even played around with the thought of using a pair of pliers, which would have definitely bricked the board. Good thing I didn't. But eventually I got through the jungle of terror and continued with the rest of the process, including soldering, which ended up being a lot easier than I thought. All I needed to do was keep an eye on the pressure across the PCB to keep the distance between it and the plate even. I then tested the switches one last time before mounting the plate to the top of the case. Finally I was ready to add the keycaps, which arguably was the most exciting part as it was like the grand reveal of all your effort. And with that the build was complete, and ready for the inaugural typing test, which unfortunately resulted in immediate regret. Look, I love this board. It's great. No, it's fantastic. Every time I ride on it, I have to giggle a bit. <laughs> I would definitely do this again, but I would do a few things differently. First, I would really, really take the time to loop it properly, or even order pre-looped switches. There are some places that offer this, but I have never bought any, so I don't know how good they are. But if you do, please let me know, because I'm very tempted. The other part is, just because you have something doesn't mean you need to actually use it. I didn't feel or hear any difference with and without the Switch films, and I should have just left it at that. Plus, the effect of the films depends not only on the Switch, but also heavily on the plate they're mounted to, as well as if it's soldered or hot swap. I didn't knew then, but I do know now. And lastly, but most importantly at least to me, when you test your looped switches, test them with the caps before soldering. Take some time to play around with it too, as some of them developed issues only after a certain amount of time. Now that they're in and that nasty whatever you want to call it sound isn't going anywhere anytime soon, I'm a bit bummed out. Ironically, it's also on some of my most frequently used keys, like the backspace. But other than that, I have nothing but good things to say about this kit, as well as a newfound respect for anyone who's into this. Not that I didn't before, but seeing the effort it takes to get everything right makes me appreciate it even more so. There were also some positive surprises. For example, I was really worried that I would miss the arrow keys, and lo and behold, on the first typing expedition, my fingers frantically searched for them. But using VIA, I remapped the right function cluster as I have no need for them otherwise. Speaking of VIA, this is the first time I got to use it, and it's a very nice addition to the world of custom. It makes changing or adding additional layers incredibly easy and most importantly, incredibly customizable. Getting used to the split also didn't take too long. I only encountered two repeating issues. One where my left hand kept trying to hit the Y key, while the second one was kinda by choice. I knew that by splitting up the backspace I would need to get used to the smaller key, but didn't know that my aim would be that bad, frequently hitting delete or in between them on accident. But I would say that by now I'm pretty versed with using this layout. I'm continuing to appreciate this pastime activity more and more, and I understand that going into customs can be a very time-consuming endeavor. Buying all the parts is one thing, and I would say that the basic assembly, that is, doing everything without lubing, is fairly easy. Although that would be like buying a sports car and driving it around the suburbs in eco mode, which isn't really what it was meant for. 
Then there's the price. This entire build, not including shipping and labor, cost me around $635, which is an exuberant amount of money. But as a friend of mine once said, let's call him Mr. M, we're spending so much time using keyboards in our daily lives that it seems a bit odd to pay so little attention to how they might affect our comfort or well-being, compared to other daily utensils like office chairs or desks. And I have to agree with that. Before this, I never thought much about keyboards and was more focused on how they looked than anything else. But I spent around 12, sometimes even 16 hours a day working from home and then later on making these videos. So I think if you take the actual usage you get out of this and compare it to something like a good office chair or a nice desk, the price doesn't seem to be that ridiculous anymore. Plus, it's a lot of fun. Hey, thank you so much for watching. I much appreciate it and I can't believe that the channel has grown to over 2,000 subscribers. It took around 10 months to reach the first one while only taking around 2 weeks to double that, which is amazing and I'm a bit lost for words to be honest. Anyway, to commemorate this, I'm gonna be giving away an R75 along with the holiday themed keycaps which Nufa has very kindly sent me, which is all thanks to everyone who watched that video by the way, so it only makes it right to give this board to one of you. So how is this going to work? I plan to do a Q&A video in late December to wrap up this first year on YouTube. To enter, just submit a question to the community post which went live on the channel page today. It's open worldwide and the winner will be announced in said video, so there's time until around the 25th of December. If you don't have questions, you can also just write a comment. It doesn't really matter. I think everyone should have a chance to enter and I'll be picking one randomly from all the submissions. Honest criticism is also very welcome, as I'm still trying to find my groove here, so I appreciate any feedback I can get. So if you have any questions or anything else you want to say, don't hesitate. Until then, thank you again for watching, thank you for sticking around till the end, and see you in the next one. Bye!